And tonight I'll be talking about the user, and that's basically us here, really. Uh, and uh, this nice little undertitle, the unknowing knowing nemesis, nemesis of IT security. But before I really start with this, I just want to squeeze in a little disclaimer. Because I'll be talking about how to get people to hand out sensitive information. Uh, and I'll be doing this because I believe that how, if you know how a criminal thinks, you're better off preventing them from be, being successful. But if, of some reason, you take something from this talk and go out and use it somewhere, and most of this is not necessarily legal, it's just that you might end up in trouble and you could lose your job depending on where and what you're doing. So, in the worst, worst case, you could actually uh, be prosecuted. Um, so don't, don't, don't try this unless it's in some sort of controlled environment. Um, let's start off with the uh, good stuff. So, what is social engineering? Well, it's, it, I can tell you what it isn't. It's not sitting in your basement, looking a bit like the Grim Reaper, uh, hacking away. It's more the opposite of it. Um, you're trying to use whatever makes us human, so we will perform actions that we might not have done otherwise. Uh, and it's all about blending in and looking like you're confident enough to be where you are and do what you're doing, even if you're not supposed to be there. But in most cases, it's about dressing up your information so it looks legitimate in order to extract sensitive information. And I'll go through uh, these different kinds uh, a little bit later. First, I would like to just define security. Uh, in its core, security is really about trust. And we have two sides here. We have the system security. And here, the, uh, the user has a trust to the system that is actually keeping them safe. And on the other side, the system trusts the user not to compromise it. And this balance here is basically what we call security. And one of these sides is easier to exploit. Uh, and that just happens to be the user. Uh, so social engineering is, is really hacking the individual behind the keyword, keyword, the keyboard even, uh, also sometimes referenced as the wetware. Um, so while we're trying to harden our software and, and uh, hardware security, we're in a sense lowering the overall security because we as users become more confident in that, and in that way we're lowering our, on our own guards, leaving us vulnerable from attacks from other directions. And there are, so in a sense, social uh, engineering is the art of manipulating and uh, exploiting all those factors that makes us humans. And there are quite many different types of social engineering, but they can be pr broadly divided into two fields. And that's remote physical engineering and... F uh, uh, remote social engineering and physical social engineering, where remote is that you contact someone through a remote channel, where it could be a telephone or an email, and physical is where you actually try to gain uh, access to a location without permission. Uh, I'll go through these attacks a little bit later, but first off, I would like to start to talk about this man here. I'm not sure if anyone recognizes him, but his name is John Owen Brennan, age 60. And his current occupation is director of uh, the Central Intelligence Agency, better known as the CIA. So why am I really talking about him? On October 12th, this year, 2015, he was hacked. Now, it was his personal AOL account that was hacked, so it wasn't his work account, which probably have been even more devastating. 
But him being human, he has forwarded materials from his work account to his personal account because of convenience, because we all know it's easier to access our personal accounts than our work accounts. Although the most interesting part here is actually how they did it. And it turns out it's a simple five-step process. And they started off reading, ha having one piece of information, and that was his phone number. Uh, and they, in step one, they did a reverse lookup of, of his phone number. And that sounds complex, maybe, but it's basically just entering his phone number on, uh, onto an online uh, uh, directory service. And that would give them basic information about where he lives and stuff like that. But in America, we also get which mobile phone company, carrier, that that phone number belongs to. And in this case, it was Verizon. So in step two, these hackers call Verizon, claiming to be a Verizon technician and wanted to have information about this customer's uh, account. And they say that they have temporarily lost system access and they need that information now. Uh, because the customer is waiting. So in step three, this Verizon support person who was taking the call, who is properly trained, asked for something called the V code. And the V code is a unique ID that is given to all Verizon employees. And these hackers provide a fake one. Now it's not entirely clear how they got hold of a fake one, but as many things, it's probably quite easy to figure it out just being a bit creative. So they passed that security challenge and uh, receive information about his account, including his AOL email address and, and this is important, the four last digits of his bank card. So in step four, they call AOL support now claiming to be Mr. Brennan. And they tell AOL that they have lost access to the account. So in step five, the final step, AOL starts asking security questions. And one question is about the four lost digits on that bank card that is attached to that account. And since Verizon so kindly had given that information to the hackers, they could provide it to AOL, which then gave them access to his account. And this whole story will probably unfold during the next few weeks because WikiLeaks has went out and said that they will publish material from this uh, guy's personal account. So we'll see what happens. Uh, moving on to the next example I have tonight. Um, again, those four lost digits uh, on a credit card is going to play a major role in destroying a person's entire digital life. Uh, I would like to talk about a person who, uh, whose name is, is Matt Honan. Uh, he's a journalist and he's written award-winning articles for, among others, uh, Wired and Gizmondo. Um, and he was also hacked. So on the 3rd of August 2012, uh, someone, the hacker, called Amazon Support, claiming to be Mr. Matt Honan. Now, what they wanted to do was to add a credit card to his account that he had with them. And by providing a little bit of information, basic information that you could probably Google, Amazon went ahead and added a credit card to the account. Now it turns out that that credit card was fabricated. It was numerically valid, but it was fake. And you can do this easily in seconds on some online generator somewhere. Uh, so now when they had that credit card on the account, they called Amazon support a second time. This time, they still claiming to be Mr. Bre uh, sorry, Mr. Honan, uh, but they said they lost access. And 
since they could actually provide an entire credit card number that was attached to that account, which, was, which, which happened to be the fabricated one, but it was still attached to the account, Amazon went ahead and gave them access. Now they could log into uh, Honan's uh, Amazon account, and Amazon displays the four last digits of any credit card attached to an account uh, on, their uh, on their My Pages part. So they took the four last digits of an actual credit card owned by uh, Matt Honan, and then they, th this is actually really where the ball started to roll. Um, and at 4.33 p.m. that day, Apple received a phone call from someone pretending to be Matt Honan. Now, he had an email address provided by Apple, so they claim they can't uh, log in. And Apple considered the four lost digits of credit card confidential and proof of identity, whereas Amazon doesn't. Uh, so they could give these four, four digits, and gained access to the account because Amazon issued a temp oh, sorry, <laughs> Apple uh, issued a temporary uh, password. So at 4.50, his Apple email account was permanently reset. And just a few minutes after that, his Google account was permanently reset. And this was made possible by uh, Matt having as assigned his Apple account as an alternative email address on his Google account. So they could just reset it and receive the reset email from his Apple account. And the real motivation for this was actually gaining access to his Twitter account in order to disgrace it. So just a minute later, they actually reset it. his Twitter account, which was c uh, connected to his Gmail. And they could really have stopped here, because now they had what they wanted. But they wanted to make sure that he couldn't easily regain access to his accounts. So, at 4.50 p.m., they used uh, an online service from Apple to remotely wipe his iPhone completely clean. And a minute after that, they wiped his iPad. I'm sure you heard of iCloud, and you can do this kind of stuff there if you have access. But they went a little bit further. And just a minute after that, they remotely wiped his MacBook. Now, being a journalist, he has everything on his MacBook. So that destroyed his complete digital life, including all his family photos. And of course, it didn't stop there because they deleted his Google account. And he uses this for work. So his entire email archive was gone. Um, and then, at 5.12 p.m., they bragged about this on Twitter, using his own very own Twitter, Twitter account. And all this took 39 minutes and it serves as a powerful demonstration of how, how basic browsing knowledge combined with social engineering skills can completely destroy a person's digital life. But he got to write an article about it, so he got something out of it. Um, I would like to continue now with talking about different kinds of social engineering attacks that exist. There are more, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the, the, the major ones. Um, first of all, we have phishing. And I'm sure everyone has heard about this. This is the most famous attack that exists. And it's basically sending emails that look legitimate, comes from a trustworthy source, to a, a large number of, of uh, receivers. Uh, it could also be combined with a legitimate looking website for some logging or something. Uh, and the, the idea here is to collect username, password, credit card details, uh, and so forth. Uh, and this involves sending bulk mails to a large number of people. And it's a bit random who will actually take the bait. So there's a specialized form of phishing called spare phishing 
where you send emails to a particular group or an individual. And here, they're often quite well researched. So because of that, they're usually also quite successful because they know more about you than you might know. Um, let's see. Next one is coming up. Now, uh, road apples. This is probably not that much known as, as phishing, but what it is really is that the attacker will place an object somewhere unexpectedly, uh, as it's been dropped or something, uh, and that object uh, will somehow appeal to uh, the curiosity or the greed that we all have. Uh, and we will pick it up because we think we're going to gain some knowledge or something and we'll do something about this. And this could be a memory card, a USB stick or a CD or something like that. Um, and usually placed in a public area. Uh, for example, the rece reception area in a company or, or, or a parking lot or something like that. Uh, let's go through to the next one. Um, Dumpster diving went up there. Uh, let's keep it there. Uh, most companies do not properly destroy sen sensitive information when they throw it, throw it away with the garbage. Uh, and that could include such things as names of employees, phone numbers, emails, internal instruction manuals, including notes, and even passwords. So a social engineer that is willing to get their hands dirty and not afraid a little bit of smell could go through this and collect all the goodies. And it's not illegal. It's not illegal to go through someone's trash. Uh, State-run organizations are usually quite good at this. Uh, so they, they tend to destroy their information before they throw it out using paper shredders or some other kind of mechanism. Uh, but private companies aren't. They just throw it out. And uh, individuals aren't. So I claim that all companies should be concerned about this. And we, as private persons, should also. Because now, identity theft is becoming quite a big of a problem. And usually it starts here, when you throw out your credit card bill. The next one. Tailgating, and this, this, is, this is a classic one. It just, you're just following someone uh, through a security door. Or it could be also be a group, and you try to look like you belong to the group. And, and the trick is really to blend in, and no one will question you. Uh, the next one here is coming up. Distraction. A distraction attack, two people often work together, or more people. And it, it could be, for instance, instance, be that one person distracts a security guard, and the other person sneaks out from the other side into a secured entrance. The most common distraction attack used in the wild happens by an ATM machine. Uh, the unknowing victim is withdrawing money from a machine, and the first person uh, comes over to him and claims that he's dropped something. And when the victim looks down and possibly picks something up, the second person comes in from the other side and snatches the money as it comes out from the machine. So that's an example of a distraction attack. Um, is it coming? Yes. Shoulder surfing is really what it sounds like. This is just someone standing behind someone else and looking over their shoulder in order to gain information. And this could be logging into a computer or a, a smartphone or entering a pin on a security door. And the next one is coming up. Yes. The boy who cried wolf. Now this is a very descriptive name. And it's really the same as the classic tale. 
It was empty, so it's okay. Um, here, someone will try to set off an alarm repeatedly without an obvious reason. And what will happen to an alarm that goes off on and on and on? Any guess? Someone will turn it off. And they probably call maintenance because it needs to be fixed. So that location that was so cleverly protected by an alarm will be wide open for intrusion. Next one, water holing. This, 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 um, I'll describe this this way, that if you're, if you're hunting a rodent that's sort of bothering you at home, and you need to place a trap, you're gonna find out a, pl a place where that rodent likes to appear, and there's where you're gonna put the trap. So in social engineering, you start off with finding a legitimate existing website, where your target group is going to visit. And then you poison that website. Uh, that could be malicious code that you, you, you somehow get onto that website and then you just sit back and wait for someone to take the bait. The last uh, attack I'm just gonna go through is this one here, impersonation. This is, this is uh, really a classic social engineering uh, attack. It's, it's pretending to be someone else. And the two examples that I had previously is using this when they call uh, support. And it, we are really good at this. We're good at acting, we're good at, at pretending, and we're even good at lying. So in the right circumstances, this is a very powerful attack. Um, these are, these are the one attacks that uh, I want to go through in order to go to the next part here. Um, and I'm going to talk about physical social engineering. And that's when you try to get, gain access to a location without permission. And instead of, of me standing here talking about lots of different real things that has happened, I was going to try to turn this, if possible, into an interactive exercise. And this here is a fictional company. Uh, and I have tried to make this a little bit easier because we don't have that much time. Uh, and we will have two goals here. The first goal that we'll have is that we need to gain the shared secret key of the internal Wi-Fi network. And the second goal is that we need to put a USB stick on the machine in the server room, which is the green one up here. Uh, and there's one rule here. Uh, we can only use social engineering skills. So there's no hacking involved, except for people. Uh, and I'll start this off, and if anyone wants to pitch in with something, you just say it uh, straight out. And you can contribute with uh, social engineering tricks that you m think might work, or you could try to put me in my place and raise security. Anything is welcome. So I'll start this off. So we arrive through the main entrance to the reception, and these doors here are security doors. They require you to swipe a card to enter, but you don't have one, you're not an employee here. So, do anyone have a suggestion how we could actually go through that door? Yeah? Where are the smokers? The smokers, yes. Tailgate you could tailgate the smokers. So, let's say they're out here smoking and you could sort of hang around here until someone, someone enters and you'll just go through. That's one way of doing it, that's a good one. Uh, yeah? That's a really good one, because... Exactly. So let's say, going uh, along uh, that line, that you show up here carrying like three cups of coffee, and you have no jacket on, and it's cold like today outside. So you're coming here with three cups of coffee, and you're walking like this, and, and you can't swipe the card unless you put the 
uh, put the coffees down or, or something like that. And someone arrives and they see you need help. So what do they do? They swipe their card, open the door for you. And since you don't have a jacket on, you've probably been in here already because no one is coming without a jacket and you have coffee for a meeting. So of course you, you're welcome in. So that's a good one. Any other suggestions? Let's say we have a receptionist here. And now I'm raising security. <laughs> we have a receptionist here. So now we actually have to tell her or him that we arrived and it's going for a meeting or something. So we need to get past that person. Do you have any suggestions for that? You could be invited. So, so you, let, 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 let's see if we go along, along that line. So, an hour before we, we are, we are going to try to get in here, we call the receptionist and we claim to be some manager of this company. And we're telling this person that, well, I'm really busy right now and in about an hour I'm going to have a person, uh, a customer, very important customer, coming to visit. And this is, this is the fate of the company. And I can't come down myself. Could you just let this person in? And if we can convince this person that this is true, when we arrive an hour later, we'll just say the, our name and who we're going to visit, and they're going to let us in. Um, if we remove the receptionist for a bit and we put the revolving door here, where you can only fit one person, and you still need to swipe a card, but you can only go one, one at a time. We can't tailgate. So how will we get in? I mean, we could use, probably try to use the same coffee trick or something, but let's assume we can't use that. You can still be invited in, but by an actual employee at the company. How? If you're a consultant agency, you want to... I'll help you out. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we show up here, and this time we look, look a bit stressed, maybe a bit sweaty, you know, we've been rushing here. And, and we're going, we're like looking in our pockets, we can't find our security card. And another person arrives, and you tell them, well, I just started working here this week, and this is the second time I forgot the security card. Last time I called my manager, and he was really pissed about it, and I can't call him again. Couldn't you just swipe me in this time? And what would you say to that? Could you say, well, good luck. He's probably a colleague to you, so I mean, you're going to have to get along. So what you will do is, okay, it's a revolving door, so you swipe him in, and he passes through. And now you can't pass through, but another person can go through before you. Because uh, you can't go twice, but you can allow someone else to go in between, or there's a set time on it. So you can still help person through, and if they have a clever enough story, you will do it. So, okay, we'll, we'll skip the reception area now. We're actually inside. What do we do? Now we need to get the shared secret key of the Wi-Fi network. That's a good start, because as any, any good place, there, there, there might be passwords written somewhere. Yeah? Uh, or maybe someone is logged into it, uh, can uh, sneak over those shoulders. You could do that. Um, but, uh, maybe that's a I, I, I'll, I'll tell you a much easier way. Ask someone. We just <laughs> ask someone. Why shouldn't we just ask someone? We're inside. We're part of this secret club. So, we'll walk into the office space. We try to find someone who looks really busy. You know, he's, he's, he's concentrating on doing his job. Maybe he sits a little bit by himself somewhere. We approach him and we, we are very polite and say, again, I just started here and, and you know, IT support hasn't really sorted my account out, but I, I do need internet access. I need to get hold of my private email or whatever. Could you just please give me the Wi-Fi password? And this person, now knowing that this is a new colleague of his, and he's a bit busy, so he just, you know, he want to help, but he's just going to want to get rid of this person, will give him the Wi-Fi password. 
and that's it. And then we just walk out and we come back in the night and we sit over here and hack their system or something. So that was the first goal. Now we come to the easier one. We need to put a USB stick on in a machine in this room. And we'll skip the part how we get inside because we already know that. So we're inside. How do we get in here? Yeah, you could probably walk in there. But the problem with this door is that only a limited number of employees has access to open that door. So any suggestions how we can do that? That's, that's, that's like phishing in a, in a sense. And we all know how out IT managers are. They don't have a clue. So they'll probably put it there. It, it could work. It's, it's quite random. It could work. Yeah. <laughs> it could work. Um, any other suggestions? Yeah? Again, the user is compromising the system. Yes, it's very true. It could be like that. And then you're lucky, though. Um, we could do it in another way. Um, we, could, we could do it by not setting foot here. And, it, and we'll, you could send a mail, but you can do something else as well. Because who has access here? IT, IT personnel, IT managers, support manager or something. Is there anyone else have access here? Janitor. Janitor. That's a good. Because janitors, they have access to the whole place. And where do janitors work generally? At another company. So they don't have loyalty to this at all. And are they paid well usually? Do they have, do they have a hard work which, which no one really seemed to give them any appraisals about? Probably. I'm generalizing a bit. but So we could actually contact the person who cleans this place and we could offer them a small but fairly substantial amount of money and say, well, the next time you sweep this room, just take this little stick, this little plastic bit, and place it behind on the back of any machine in there which is turned on. And it's still, it's a bit random because they could actually go to the police or to the management and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and report you, but it might work. But there's another way of actually doing this and it will take you about 10 minutes or so, maybe, maybe even less. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about it. We arrive here, and maybe if it's a receptionist or something, but we, we excuse ourselves and say, well, we need to go to the toilet. Yeah, I'm going to have a meeting here shortly, but I need to go to the toilet. We go to the toilet, and like any building, they will have a fire alarm system that could be set off here. So we set it off, and what happens when the fire alarm goes off? Everyone is supposed to leave. So everyone will go up, walk out, and leave. And what happens with all security doors when the fire alarm goes off? They open up because it's safety. No one should be trapped anywhere during a fire. So this door open up, and this door will most probably open up as well. So we wait a while here. And we could still get caught, but so, so we need to time it. And then we sneak in, place the USB stick, and leave. Okay, so it took a little bit longer than we thought. So the fire department arrived. Who is the first people going into a building when the fire alarm's gone off? The fire department. No one else, usually. Because the fire department needs to go inside to check that it's actually safe. So they go in, and you didn't have time to leave. So they spot you. But well, what will they do? They will suspect that you work there. They don't know who works there. So they'd be really angry that you didn't leave. And they'd be telling you, you know, if you're on good, you always have to leave, go out to the assembly area. And then you will shove you to the side and, uh, and you can leave. Uh, and then, of course, they will check the building and everyone go back in and no one be the wiser, just thinking, okay, well, why did the fire alarm go off? They probably know it went off here. And it might be that we actually trigger it through the, the little alarm console. But no one will think to look up here. 
So we got, we got home free, and it took us probably less than 10 minutes. And that's a secured room. Uh, so that's really the scenario I w uh, wanted to go through. And now I'm going to talk a little bit of, of why this works. So why is social engineering so successful? And there are many, many different factors that makes this successful. Uh, I'll go through some of them, uh, but there are many more because human psychology is a very complex subject. I'll start off with kindness. And we as a species are very, very kind to each other. Um, you might not think uh, that if you look at the news, but we are uh, quite kind to each other, and the world would probably be even more horrible if we weren't. And social engineers know about this as well, and they'll exploit that behavior of ours. So I'll give you an example. If a stranger stops you on the street, and he looks a bit lost, and he probably is a tourist, and he asks you for directions. And if you know where he's heading, you would probably uh, help him, and then you will feel good about it. That happens all the time, and that's kindness at work. I'll give you another example. We, we touched it a little bit earlier. You're, you're standing outside an entrance, and a person shows up carrying a big, heavy box, maybe one of those that you use when you're moving places. Would you open the door for him? Probably, because you don't want to be a jerk. So you'll open the door, and he will go through. Now imagine you actually had to enter a pin code to do it. Will you still open the door? Probably. Maybe he's not wearing a jacket, so you make the assumption that he's already been there a couple of times. So you still open the door. And it's the entrance to the apartment complex where you live. Will you still open the door? Yes, and you probably welcome him to the neighborhood because you're assuming he's moving in. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't be kind. I'm just saying that people that want to exploit that behavior will. And we'll talk about how to prevent this in a few moments. Um, a more social engineering example, a bit far-fetched, uh, and I try to keep it sort of uh, compact just to, to, as an example. Let's assume a supposed coworker calls you, maybe late at night, and he uh, he wants to know your manager's name, his phone number, and possibly a cost center code. Would you give it to him? Probably not. Uh, but then he says, well, I had to cut the business trip short because my mother taken ill, and now I need new tickets home. Would you tell him then? Well, you probably still tell him, yeah, well, use your own private credit card and maybe get the money back later. But then he tells you that on his way to the airport, he was robbed completely clean, and the only thing he had left was your phone number, because he had a paper or something with it on. And now, by the grace of some stranger, he has borrowed a mobile phone and, and, and been able to call you, and he only has a few minutes. Would you give it to him then? Maybe. But would you sleep well that night if you didn't? knowing that someone might be trapped at an airport. Now, this is a far-fetched example. It just proves that there are many elaborate ways into tricking us to provide people with sensitive information. Uh, I'll move on to the next one, which is trust. And we, as, uh, we humans are very, very trusting. We're so trusting, in fact, that we have to be, be convinced with effort not to trust someone. If someone, a stranger, comes up to us and says, well, my name is this and I'm coming from this company, we will trust that he is who he claims to be. And usually, it, it turns out to be true, but we don't double check. Um, and we're, we're quicker in trusting people if we are among a group, let's say a workplace where there are lots more people. And this is because it might not be our responsibility 
to check someone's identity and the reason why they're there. So we just assume someone else has done it. Again, we're trusting the system. And it turns out that we are really, really bad at telling if someone is lying to us. Uh, we, about half the time, we're successful, and that's in a controlled study environment where the subjects knew they had to choose between untruth and truth. So in a normal environment, we'd probably be even worse. And at the same time, we are really good at lying. We're, we're, and we, we do it all the time. And as a matter of fact, we, we spend about 25% of our daily interactions with people lying. And this might be small unconscious lies about the weather or how you feel or what it might be, but to big elaborate stories. And at the age of five and maybe even earlier, we have learned how to lie. And, and, we, and this is because we also have learned that sometimes there are negative consequences in telling the truth, particularly to our parents. So we do lie all the time. Um, which makes it strange that we can't actually recognize a lie. Uh, and of course, if we trust the environment, we're also very confident, and that makes us more trustworthy, or, or, no, or trusting, actually. Um, so, in a sense, if we, if we hire, we'd make uh, the security surrounding uh, uh, higher, we, we, we make the overall security lower. Um, and we go... Th Excuse me. Yes. Uh, Or to tell if someone is lying at you? Uh, no, you please tell me. Criminals. Criminals, probably. The worst criminals is better at telling lies. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that's because, correct. Because if they were bad at it, they wouldn't be really, really hard criminals. No. It's no. A, it's an essential skill for them. It is a skill. It's a skill, skill that we all have to, to some degree. Uh, so, so, and... and, and we can use that. As a social engineer, you could use that into getting a lot of information, together with all these other ones. Uh, this is the perf personal favorite of mine, the greed and curiosity factor. And these go hand in hand. Um, uh, we, we are very greedy and very curious by nature. And this is the reason why we're so successful as a species. Uh, if we weren't curious or greedy, we wouldn't be this, this uh, evolved. Um, now, here, a social engineer would try to promise some sort of knowledge that you would gain by doing something. It could also be a monetary reward of doing something. And we are quite likely to do it because we want to have what's on offer. So I'll give you an example of what could happen. And... Now, pretend that you're, you're uh, parking in front of your office building. You step out of the car, and on the ground, there is a USB stick. Now, would you pick that up? Probably. I mean, USB sticks aren't free. Maybe it's 64 gigabytes. So it's, you know, quite a big one. Uh, and just to sugarcoat this a little bit more, there's a sticker on it, which says, Management Salaries 2015 on it. <laughs> Now, would you take that and stick that into your computer? Before this talk, you would definitely have done it, because <laughs> you'd be curious. Now, after this talk, you'll stick it in your coworker's machine instead. <laughs> it's still curiosity. We need to know. And sometimes we know the risk, but we're so curious, we need to do it. And that, as well, could be used. Uh, same goes for, for if you get an email from a supposed co coworker with a link in it, and it says, you need to see this, I never laughed this much. You know, it's tempting. And it seems like it goes to a YouTube page or something. You might click it. It's still also curiosity. Um, then we have fear. And fear makes us do things that we don't normally do. Uh, for example, and, 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 and this, this particular uh, scenario is actually the fear of losing one's job. 
if, if a management type person approaches us and wants to have some sensitive information and they are acting quite threatening, they might be telling you that, you know, if you don't do this, I'm going to go to your boss and or be a team player here. We need this information. I mean, the whole company is 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 uh, needing this and it's an important customer and so on and so on. You will be bullied into giving the information. Um, and and that's because you're afraid that if you don't give it, it would be bad for your career. It could work the other way around where you're actually promised or led to believe that it would be good for your career to give the information. Uh, but it's a sim similar kind of thing. Uh, now, this fear restricts us from checking or challenging people that we don't recognize. Uh, because if we challenge the wrong person by mistake, he might be a management person, again, that be, might be bad for our career. So we don't challenge people. The last one uh, is authority. And, and this is a good one. Uh, from when we were quite small, we learned about authority. And first off, it's our parents, and then it's our teachers, and then it might be the police, or your bosses, or society as a whole. Uh, and uh, society in itself imprints a few icons of, of uh, uh, icons that represent authority into us. And I'll give you a few silly examples of this. So, again, imagine you're driving your car into a parking uh, uh, lot, and there's one space left. But on that space, there's a traffic cone. So would you park there? Probably not, because the traffic cone is there for a reason. It's there to protect us. I mean, maybe the ground is unsafe or something, but it's there for a reason. And the traffic cones, in this case, respects authori uh, represent authority, and we respect that. Now, let's say we park there anyway. So we just move the traffic cone and park a car. You, know? you can feel the rush here. Um, and when we, when we stop the car, a guy out of nowhere appears and knocks on the window. And he's wearing a yellow reflective vest. And you're sort of lowering the window and you utter this nervous hello. And he tells you with a confident, firm voice that you cannot park here. Please move your car. And what will you do? Well, I'll tell you what you do. You put the car in a reverse and go and park somewhere else without arguing. And the reason was the yellow reflective vest. Because again, it represents someone who has authority in, in something. So we, so we, we trust these things. Um, I'll give you another silly example of this. And if you imagine a person walking around at your workplace carrying a clipboard. Now he's taking notes. You put a nice suit on this person. And, and if you really want to go American, we put a hard hat on, but, but we don't go there. Uh, that guy looks like he knows what he's doing. And he's there of a reason. He's checking something up. And it's probably for your own good. So we won't challenge him. If we place two of them together, they are home safe. No one's going to ask why they're there. They're there doing a job. If we put... Uh, sort of scruffy looking clothes on them, they are not as authoritative looking. So a person that dresses very nicely and looks clean has more authority. And if, the, if he's there of, an, of a believed reason, he has even more authority. And this same goes for people in work clothes. If a builder is running around at your workplace, you probably won't question why he's there. Or a handyman, well, he's probably there to fix a broken lamp bulb or something in, in, in a toilet. Or cleaners. We, we just look at them as, and assume that they are there of a reason. And, and this is authority at play. It's not authority as being the police. It's just authority in doing something that is important for someone. And we, don't, we shouldn't disturb or question that. Uh, always 
question authority. Don't tell my boss I said that, but always question it. So that was a little bit on, on why this works. And I was, so that was the fun bits. Now we need to stop them. And uh, to be honest, it is close to impossible to completely prevent social engineering because it's really taking advantage of what makes us human. But it is possible to create an environment which is more difficult to manipulate uh, and take advantage of the human factor. So the first bit is to raise awareness and have continuous education. And that might be talks like this or professional workshops with role playing. Or it could be as simple as telling everyone not to click that link in that email, which everyone is doing out of some reason. The second thing that needs to be done is to have proper routines within security. And this, this is, this is uh, basically challenging people, why are you here? And this doesn't have to be formal. Uh, and it could easily be that you just approach someone and say, well, who are you? What are you doing here? And then you add, well, I'll escort you then. Because the worst thing that the social engineer can, 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 be, uh, c can happen to that uh, person is that they are escorted around. It defeats the entire purpose. Because they can't carry out doing what they're supposed to do if someone is looking at them all the time. So it's quite easy, but as human, the human nature stops us from doing this. So it has to become second nature for everyone. And it has to be accepted by management. Because management has to accept that they sometimes will be stopped by um, employees who don't know who they are. Uh, without them fearing for their career or their job. So again, the fear factor. Uh, thirdly, we need to have reporting channels where you can actually report suspicious activities. Um, and a reason why we don't really have good statistics over social engineering is because most companies don't have that. You don't know who, who you're going to talk when you get a phishing email that, that, is, uh, that is actually uh, sent to you as a person, or if someone is running around at the office and you don't know who they are. Uh, but there's another factor why we don't have statistics either, and that's uh, because you don't really want to admit that you're being conned. Someone comes and plays a very easy trick on you, and you get fooled. You're not going to tell anyone, uh, particularly not some superior. Um, but all these are not enough, uh, and the best, best uh, way of pretending it, pre preventing it is actually to become a victim yourself. Uh, because if you've been burnt, you're going to be more suspicious the next time. And instead of sitting around waiting for a malicious hacker to show up at your doorstep, uh, you can actually ha uh, have these tests on your own organization. Note here, because I see you all are thinking about things now. You should never do this unless you have approv uh, approved uh, from some, someone in management. You should always be sanctioned. Uh, but it's even better to allow uh, a professional company to do this. So legitimate security professional will come in and, and a bit like a normal IT security penetration test, They'll use social engineering skills to try to extract sensitive information from the workforce. Uh, now, this, this is a little bit of what I tried to do tonight, although I'm not entirely sure how success successful it has been because it's not that kind of place and, uh, and venue. But I'll just ask you one, this question. Is, did, did anyone try this network? You did. Yep. What happened? Uh, it, wasn't successful. it wasn't successful, but it did exist. Yep. Yes. This, this network here is running off my machine. <laughs> uh, the password is wrong, so you couldn't, you couldn't actually uh, log on.
But this, this, this is, now, now let's place ourselves as malicious hackers. And we'll go to a coffee shop. We, and we put a sign like this somewhere there. And then you can just imagine the number of usernames, passwords, and credit card details that you can harvest from such an attack. And this by just sitting back in a nice chair, enjoying a cup of coffee, and letting, letting human nature do all the work for you. Thanks for listening.